Acts chapter 8 starting in verse 1. It says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, that's speaking of Stephen, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. We'll stop right there. That'll be our text for today. Short, it's uh, kind of a transition passage between two longer passages, but um, I got two very short and simple points today. And that is, first of all, we're going to see the persecution that begins, for the first time the word persecution is used in verse 1, against the church. Secondly, we'll see how this persecution actually uh, expands the kingdom of God. Because those who are scattered end up preaching the gospel to more people. Uh, Let me give you the quick context. In the last few weeks we've seen um, what was going on with Stephen. Stephen was a wonderful man of God, but uh, the Jews arrested him. They took him to the Sanhedrin. And uh, they accused him of speaking against the law and against Moses and against the temple. And he gave his defense, it wasn't exactly a defense, but, uh, and he made them so angry that they attacked him and stoned him. We saw that last week. Uh, one thing that we saw in verse 58 from chapter 7, it said, uh, in, the mid- in the middle of the verse, it says, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, as they were the witnesses were supposed to be the first ones that would stone Stephen and they wanted to be able to do it right so they were taking off their coats because they don't want clothes getting in the way as they're swinging the stones so they're taking off their coats and they're putting them at the feet of a young man named Saul that's the first introduction to this man Saul who is mentioned again in our passage today in verse 1 it says now Saul was consenting to his death who is Saul? Saul is the Apostle Paul. The amazing thing, the one who would become the great Apostle Paul. And the amazing thing is that I would say that many Christians would possibly say that uh, Paul was the greatest theologian that ever lived or the greatest missionary who ever lived. And yet, when we first meet him, he is the greatest enemy of Christ and the church. And he wanted to destroy the church. And so, since this is the first time that we meet Saul, I thought we could, I could give you a little bit of background on the man uh, before we look at the text. Uh, tradition says, now it's the, this is not in the Bible, so I'm just kind of throwing this out on the side. Tradition says that he was born the same year that Jesus was born. That's possible. Um, we know he was born in Tarsus. There's a reason I have the map, because there's a bunch of places mentioned. Uh, he was born in Tarsus. Tarsus is way up here, okay, let me write born in Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, right there, Israel down here Um, Tarsus was a very important city trade routes were going by there, they were coming from Europe down to Asia and to Africa and had like a huge university there, and at some point in his life, we don't know when exactly, Saul moved to Jerusalem to study theology you know Jerusalem down here about there, that's Jerusalem. Okay, and so uh, he studied under a very famous rabbi named Gamaliel. That should ring a bell because we actually saw Gamaliel in Acts chapter five. If you remember, the twelve apostles had been arrested and they were taken to the Sanhedrin. And then there was a guy, a rabbi, who stood up and he said, "You know what? Let them let them go. If if what they're doing is of God, we can't stop it anyway. And if they're not of God, they'll fail." And so they let the apostles go. Well, that was Gamaliel. That was the he was a very famous rabbi, and the uh, Saul grew up learning theology from him. Now, here's the thing. We read here how Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. Uh, 
Saul thought he was correct. He was an honest man. Uh, he believed that Stephen was a blasphemer and he believed that persecuting the church was the right thing to do. He thought that he was doing God's work. He, he thought that he was doing the will of God. He was zealous. He was honest, shall we say. But he was completely wrong. And I wanted to just throw out something here on the side as a side note because there are a lot of people who say well it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're really honest as long as you're really zealous as long as you really believe it as long as you put all your heart into it it's good enough not true your faith is only as good as the object of your faith if I say hey I believe in this cup or I believe, I believe in that chair. And I really believe in that chair. I put all my faith in that chair. I'm really zealous. Don't you dare say anything about that chair. That's pointless. That's meaningless. My faith means nothing. It doesn't matter how much faith I have in something that is meaningless. The only true faith that matters is the faith in the one true triune God. Okay? So, you have Saul here, which is persecuting the church. But he's completely wrong. Um, so having seen that, let's look at the text. This great persecution. It says, uh, verse 1, it says, At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, I read some people who were suggesting that this persecution was mostly against the Hellenistic Jews. They had the Hellenistic Christians, the Christians who spoke Greek rather than Hebrew, uh, for a couple of reasons. Because it says that the apostles did not leave. They were still there in Jerusalem, and the apostles were Hebrews, not Hellenists. Uh, secondly, if, if you keep on going in the book of Acts, you see that the church in Jerusalem is not dissolved. It's still there. In fact, it's thriving. So, it's not that everyone scattered. A certain group of people scattered. Um, and thirdly, Stephen, who caused this persecution, was a Hellenist. And so it's possible that the Jews got really upset with Stephen who was a Hellenist, and then went after the other Hellenists in the church. Of course, yes, of course, if you start persecuting one portion of the church, it's going to affect the entire church. But I'm just saying, um, it's possible that they were mostly going after the Hellenists. Either way, we're told that they scattered to Judea and Samaria. That's where I got my map. You know where Judea, Judea is right here? I can't write it, it's too small. Jerusalem is in Judea, but... The church was in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem. They hadn't spread out yet. And Samaria is right above it over here. Okay? Now, uh, in Acts 11, there, it speaks of this same persecution that occurred at the time of Stephen. And it says that they didn't just move from Jerusalem to, Samaria, to uh, Judea and Samaria. It says they also moved up to Phoenicia over here. Phoenicia. They also went to Cyprus. And they also went to Antioch. Antioch is a city over here. Very important as we're going to go along in the book of Acts. Okay? So the church was all in one place in Jerusalem. But now because of the persecution that occurs, they start spreading all over the world. Okay? Now, keep on going. In verse 2, we have the last word concerning Stephen. Verse 2 says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. The Jews said that you had to bury a person. You couldn't just let a dead body lie around in the ground. But Jewish law said that a stoned person was not allowed to be lamented over. Because if you stone a person, that means that he's a criminal. A blasphemer. And so, yes, you should bury him, but you're not allowed to mourn for him. Well, these people don't care. They defy their, these rules. This wasn't a rule of God. This was a rule of, that the Jews had come up with. They, and they defy those rules and says they have a great lamentation over Stephen. And 
I got to make a side note here because this is something that's been in my mind for a while over the last few weeks when we've been talking about Stephen. And this is the last mention of him, so I wanted to get it out because I hadn't mentioned it before. If you had this situation with Stephen where he was arrested and he said what he said to the Sanhedrin and then got killed and then you have this big persecution. If you had this same situation today in the church, I know that there would be a lot of people who would say, you know what, Stephen was a great guy, but he went a bit too far. He didn't need to say the things that he said. He didn't need to go to the Supreme Court of Israel and say you're a bunch of stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hot and, and ears. You, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You never obey the law. He didn't need to say those things. There's, there's a way to deal with stuff. And he brought this upon himself and he got killed. And now not only that, now they're chasing us also because of what he said. But let me remind you that like four times in the previous chapters it speaks of Stephen as being full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of wisdom. So if anyone has a problem with what Stephen said, they're wrong, not Stephen. Stephen did exactly what he was supposed to do and said exactly what he was supposed to say even if it got him killed. I just needed to throw that out there because it's important. So, verse 3, turning back to Saul now. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. That word he made havoc there in the ancient Greek is a word that is used for wild animals when they're tearing things apart. So, Luke is basically telling us the soul was trying to tear the church apart. I mean, this is, this, is like, this is like the Nazis, the Gestapo that goes and breaks down the door in the middle of the night and comes and arrests you and drags you out. This is like, like in communist countries where George has told us, George and Maria who, live in, who used to live in Bulgaria before the fall of communism, they've told me stories about uh, Christian pastors that they knew where people would come in the middle of the night and take him away and you would never hear from them again that's what Saul was doing that's what the Apostle Paul before he got saved was doing he was going into houses and dragging out not only men and women he wouldn't go in and say who's the head of the family or who's the man of the house both men and women and he would drag them to prison and here it only mentions prison, but that's not all that happened. Let me read you a couple of verses. Later on in Acts chapter 22, you don't have to go there, but uh, Paul is speaking to a bunch of Jews and he's giving them their testimony. And he says, I persecuted the way, the way is Christianity, I persecuted the way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Later on in Acts 26, he's speaking to King Agrippa and he says these words, Many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, so this is not just putting them into jail, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. So what Saul did was he would break into houses, arrest people, drag them to jail, interrogate them, and punish them, and if they did not deny Christ, he would try and force them to blaspheme. Of course, when he was doing it, he didn't think that he was causing them to blaspheme. He thought that they were the blasphemers, and he was trying to get them to, you know, straighten them out. But now, after he gets saved, he realizes that he was the blasphemer, and he was trying to get the Christians to blaspheme. That was Saul. And even though he was forgiven, I know he was forgiven. We all know he was forgiven. And he knew he was forgiven. He understood forgiveness and redemption better than anyone. Even though he was forgiven when he believed in Christ, I know that he still... I don't want to say he didn't get over this, but uh, I'm sure he did. But I know that he remembered it. I know he thought about it all the time because he talks about it all the time. Throughout the book of Acts... Through his epistles, he talks about it all the time, how he persecuted the church. And, you know, when we, if I said to someone, what do you think of Paul? We'll say, oh, he was one of the greatest men who ever lived. And he was. But if you asked him, he'd probably say, oh, I was the worst sinner ever. And he does say that in 1 Timothy 
1 Timothy 1. If you want to learn a verse for this week, 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Those are Paul's words towards the end of his life. And then he goes on to speak of the mercy of God for saving such a sinner as him. And here's the thing. The conversion of Saul gives me personally great hope. Because if you have someone who hates Christ that much, who hates the church that much, and yet gets saved... Maybe there's hope for people in our families. Maybe there's hope for our friends. And you'll say, well, Paul was a, a special case. God had to knock him over and blind him. Yeah, well, maybe he'll do it with our families also. God does that. So, let's go back to the text. The persecution has begun. But, this is what happens. Verse 4, it says, Therefore, because of the persecution, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. In Acts chapter 1, um, before Jesus ascended to heaven, and he gave a uh, mission to his disciples, he said to them, and I had said to you, when we were back in chapter 1, I, I told you that this was the theme of the entire book. He says to his disciples, and Acts 1.8. He says, go to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will give you power and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay? Now, the church at this point, we're in Acts chapter 8, the church at this point has been around for probably a couple of years. How far have they gotten in their mission? Not at all. Nothing. Zero. They're still in Jerusalem. And you'll say to me, Nico, I know, but it's very early. You can't get to the ends of the earth that quickly. True. But, how far have they gotten? Not at all. They're still in Jerusalem. And I'm not saying they were a bad church. They were a good church. But they're not yet doing exactly what, God, what Jesus told them to do. He had said, move out. And they have not done it. And so, God uses persecution... To force them to move out. God uses persecution to fulfill the Great Commission. And this is, this is the amazing thing. This is the amazing thing. That evil people are trying to destroy the church. And yet in the very same act of trying to destroy the church. God increases the church. This is an amazing thing that God does all the time. Like for example, with Jesus. You had, uh, you had Herod, you had Pilate, you had the Jewish leaders. All these people trying to kill him. Trying to murder him. And they do. And yet, in that very same act of murdering Jesus, God accomplishes the greatest work ever, which is the forgiveness of our sins. This is what happens. This is the wisdom of God. The attacks of Satan against the church not only destroy the church, but expand the church. You know, the means in which the church expands. I um, tell you about this one guy. I was reminded of this uh, church writer, ancient church writer, Tertullian. <laughs> Who knows Tertullian? Everyone knows Tertullian. Okay. Okay. guy's like, yay! Um, Tertullian was a church writer. He wrote around the year 200. And uh, when Christianity was still illegal, by the way. And he, he has said a lot of famous things. He wrote tons of books. He has many famous quotes. He's actually the man who came up with the term Trinity for God, in case you're wondering. Um, but Tertullian had this one very famous phrase, which was, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. If you've ever heard that, Tertullian said that. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What does that mean? Well, up until the time that he wrote that, the church had been around for 170 years. And first they had persecution by the Jews, then they had persecution by the Roman Empire. And yet, the more the church was being persecuted, the more the church grew. And you're like... How does this work? You know, they're trying to destroy the church and instead the church is growing and becoming more powerful. How is that possible? Well, 
Let me tell you why. When you have people who would rather die than deny Christ, people notice. When you have people who would rather be burnt to death, who would rather be crucified, who would rather be thrown to wild animals than deny Christ, people are like, what is up with this? Maybe these people see something that I don't see. Maybe these people know something that I don't know. Where do they get the strength to do this? And the more the church was persecuted and the more Christians were killed, the more the church grew. It's the same thing that happens here. Satan's attacks upon the church, this is the wisdom of God, that the very attacks of Satan upon the church are what result in the expansion of the church, the expansion of the kingdom of God. Who would have thought? But let me close. That was very quick today. Let me close with this. Let me close with one last thought from verse 4. It says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching. The word, that word preaching in Greek is evangelizo, where we get the word evangelize. Evangelizo means what? It comes from the word evangelio, where we get, that's gospel. Evangelio means good news. Like we have the gospel, it means good news. So when it says they went around evangelizing, it means they went around giving the good news. Okay? So I want you to picture this for a moment. You have crowds of people who have been chased out of their homes. They've left their homes. They've left their jobs. They've left their families. They're running for their lives. And yet everywhere they go, they say, let me tell you the good news. Ever think about that? Let me tell you the good news. Good news? Don't you see what's going on in your life? Yeah, I know, but there's something way better than that. Because the good news is that Christ came. The Messiah has come, and all who believe in Him and repent of their sins can be forgiven and be made right with God and become the children of God. This is good news. And I know we have huge problems being persecuted and people are trying to kill us, but this transcends all of that. And here's the thing, here's the thing. I know that we all have problems. Some of us have serious, serious problems. I'm not trying to minimize anyone's problems. But what I want us to remember, what I, I just want you to remember, is that there is good news. I don't want your problems to make you forget the good news. That if you're a Christian, God has forgiven you. You are made right with God. God is not your enemy. God loves you and you're his child. And that is good news to tell other people who have problems also. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.